Um, so just so you know, we are recording this session and we will be sharing it on the CoLab's website and with, um, in particular, we're going to be making sure the folks who are uh, participating right now in the care and equity module of Design Forward uh, get a chance um, to view it because it obviously ties into the topic of that module. And I should say that Design Forward is in many ways kind of the um, foundation of why we are here today. Um, and I am so, so, ha so happy to welcome my friend Jesse Stommel to the virtual room. Um, I've known Jesse for, I don't know, like seven years now. Um, we worked together for um, a number of years at the University of Mary Washington in the Division of Teaching and Learning Technologies there. Um, but Jesse has a long and storied history um, in this work um, in digital pedagogy, critical pedagogy. Um, and he's uh, just informed me that on top of everything, he also teaches yoga. So um, much like Kayla Gaudet, what can't Jesse do? Um, right now, Jesse is currently working in the writing program at the University of Denver, where he is living um, with his partner and his adorable, adorable um, daughter, Hazel, who is five. And he is also a higher education pedagogy fellow for the Hope Center um, for College Community and Justice. If you're not familiar with the work of the Hope Center, it is um, an amazing organization. If um, Robin or, well, probably not Robin, it might be harder for Robin, but for Hannah, somebody could drop the link to Hope into the chat, that would be great. I think some folks who don't know about it would be interested in learning more. Jesse is so much more a documentary filmmaker. He teaches courses on um, pedagogy, film, digital studies, composition. Um, and in particular, we have him here today. Um, I would say one big reason is that Jesse is sort of um, a, been a silent partner for me um, in the design and imagining of Design Forward, which as many of you know, is um, our new faculty development initiative here at um, Plymouth State University. And we've got some folks who are participating in a module on care and equity right now in the room. Um, and Jesse has been just um, such an amazing resource for me and for all of us in the collab as we thought through what this program could be and where it could take us. Um, and I asked him if he would be willing to come in and just have a conversation with me today about um, some of what the module that, that's running right now is the topics that it's intersecting with. And this week we've been really, really focusing on the topic and the issue of care and what care means within higher education. And I was a little bit unsure how that was gonna go spending a week on that because sometimes I think when we use the word care, um, we don't really talk too much about what it actually means and what we mean by it. And not surprisingly in retrospect, the conversations we have been having have been so incredible, so rich, so nuanced. Um, I think we have um, just, touched the surface and yet all, already I feel like it's expanded my thinking. And I'm gonna, the last thing I'll just say before we jump into it is that I'm already disappointed by this conversation and Jesse hasn't even spoken. And the reason I'm disappointed is I know it's not gonna be long enough because we are not going to get to even 10% of what I think I would love to talk about today, but we're gonna at least do our best to get started. So Jesse, I have a question for you to get us started. And I wonder if you would be willing to talk a little bit about the word care um, and what it means to you. And um, as just a little bit of background, I'm thinking about other words that we sometimes use to stand in for care, words like kindness or empathy or compassion or love. There's been some conversation in the module this week about people resisting the word care and words like love when we talk about teaching um, because it, we're uncomfortable with maybe the space that they need to have in pedagogy. Um, and I just wanna spend some time just really talking about the word and what it means, what it means to you, um, how we can do a better job of pinning that down um, as we go forward. And does it matter? Like, does the definition <clears throat> matter? Um, I think the words we use always matter. And I think what matters more than anything is that we are constantly inspecting the words that we use and asking questions of them. If I think about, like if I think about the journey of how I've determined what words to use for certain things, it's always a circuitous journey of sort of figuring out and sort of fine tuning what I mean when I say things. 
um, probably took me 18 years to land on the word trust as the right word to describe my pedagogical foundations, which some of you I know have heard start by trusting students. Um, but even that, I feel like I keep pressing on and I keep figuring out what's the next sentence after that. What is the set of words that we need to use to explore that even more deeply? Um, I like the list of other um, corollary words that you threw out, in part because circling around those helps me get at what I mean when I say care. Um, a word like empathy, I think that the word, I saw the word empathy being used a lot in relationship to pedagogy. Um, and it, there were tons of conversations that I found myself in where that was the word being used. This for me was about five years ago. I found myself using it a couple times in my own writing. And I, I actually, um, it's a word that I don't, it's a word that I have come to not like. Um, it, when we're talking about pedagogy, in part because there's something at the heart. It's not that I don't think empathy is a good thing. Um, I think, though, there's a presumption with empathy that that I can actually know what Martha is feeling. Um, the idea that I could be inside of Martha and be able to understand what she's going through, what her needs are. And there's something with empathy that imagines that I could do the work of empathy with that somehow the work of, of empathy could happen inside of me, that I could turn on a switch and suddenly be in Martha's shoes. And that's troubling to me. And I saw it used so often to describe like feeling empathy for, a, for the people that are in a room full of 60 students. I mean, that, like, that would be incredibly hard work for me to even just do with one person who I've known for seven years. To imagine that we could do that with students I think is is troubling. The thing I like about the word care is it suggests a set of actions that we take, a set of it is an it is a verb of something that I do, not something that is done to me, not something that just happens inside of me, but a set of actions that I take and that those actions are things that I'm responsible for. And so the thing I like about the word is the sense of responsibility that it puts on me, not necessarily on the other person. And I also think of the word hope, um, which was not one of your corollaries. I think of the word hope and particularly the way that Bell Hooks and Paulo Freire use the word hope. And they talk about a critical hope, that hope is not just something we wake up in the morning with, that hope is something that we're doing constantly, inspecting constantly. And they talk about a critical hope, which means a hope that's reflexive, a hope that's analyzing, thinking about breaking itself down in order to find deeper layers of it. And so I think that that's really important when we think about care. I said care is something that we do, but it's not something that we already know how to do with any single person that we might interact with. It has to be dialogical. It has to be a conversation. It has to start with me asking someone, hello, how are you? What do you need? Um, care has to come from that place. It can't be something that's presumptive. It can't be something that I already know how to do with any, with any individual. So those are some of the things that I'm thinking about. I also like the word compassion. Um, and I actually really like the word love and bell hooks. I don't use the word love a lot because it raises it, 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 um, it raises a set of conversations that sometimes we don't really have time for. We don't have time to really sit in hard conversations. Um, I like it because Bell Hooks talks really, really eloquently about love as well and how important love is. Love for me is a word like trust. It's a word that has to go both ways. It has to be consensual. It has to be something that is, again, also dialogic. And I, I it worries me when I hear things. You know, I remember when I first started he teaching, hearing phrases like, my students aren't my friends. Um, as a way of sort of explaining a pedagogical decision. Well, my students aren't my friends, and so. Um, I grew up in a family of social workers, therapists, um, drug and alcohol treatment counselors. So I really love the concept of boundaries, and I think boundaries are super important. But the, but the notion of students are not my friends does not, does not even seem to resemble good boundaries to me, because if they're not, to me, if they're not your friends, then what are they? Like, why couldn't they be your friends? Why couldn't love be a word that we could just use to describe that relationship? So in some ways, I feel like our bristling at some of those things comes from a place of, um, it comes from a defensive place. And I don't mean that, I don't mean that to attack the people doing it because it's a really natural place for us to be. And I think where that stems from is deep, deep labor precarity 
we don't even have time to do the physical and bureaucratic labor that's asked of us as teachers to imagine that we would also take on the extreme emotional labor of teaching is is too much to ask of a lot of us without expecting there to be some defensiveness. Uh, if, if, if I would say anything about that, though, I would say, gosh, can we kill some of that bureaucratic labor before we kill the emotional labor? Yeah, I, oh my gosh, so many things I want to respond to. And the first thing I want to talk a little bit about, um, about these words a little bit more, because I completely agree with you that like the point isn't to get the perfect meaning of the word. The point is just to continue to come back and keep interrogating and rethinking um, and reimagining for ourselves what those words could mean, because ultimately, I think that work impacts our practices and impacts the way we approach the work. Um, and I find that so important. I dropped into the chat just now. I did a podcast with Chris Friend. Um, I don't even know when it was. It was released earlier this year, but I don't know when we recorded it, but it was about love um, in, in education. And it actually, he prompted me to reach out to you because of a conversation that you led um, with me and some other folks at um, with um, University of Michigan Dearborn last fall. And I had talked a little bit about, about love. And it's really interesting because I think most people who know me, Matt just mentioned in the chat, he's from Northern New Hampshire, so he doesn't use the word love. Like uh, most people who know me well, um, I'm not like a, like, I'm not like a lovey person. <laughs> like I'm a little prickly <laughs> um, and I'm an introvert. And I don't think you think of me as like, like soft and cuddly. Um, but I've more and more been trying to reconcile for myself what it means to feel love for my students. And in that conversation with Chris, it really was an opportunity to sort of unpack that word um, and to understand that it can mean so many different things and that really we're doing a disservice to ourselves and our students and our work when we resist a word and any concept associated with that word because of some baggage that we have with one particular usage of it or one particular um, interpretation of it. So I really love, I really love the idea of kind of diving into this and unpacking this more. And the other thing of the follow-up I wanna really go on um, because you alluded to this as well, that so like in my mind, and, and one of the readings this week, the Joan Tronto reading that we're doing in Design Forward um, talks a little bit about this, about the difference between like um, doing care versus um, being caring, like what, like what that, what that means. So in my mind, um, there's, the, there's, the, there's the feeling of care, right? Like I can feel care for people. I can feel love for people. Um, so like, I care about you, Jesse, I care about your life. I care about your needs. But then there's, what does that translate into an action? Like, what am I going to extend to you? How am I going to treat you? Um, for my students, what um, flexibility am I gonna have? What sort of options am I gonna give them? that are going to extend care to them? How am I gonna do care for them? Um, and I, the problem, I think, one of the problems, one of the tensions here is that um, there are times when feeling care for people is really hard. Um, and it can be hard for lots of different reasons, but just as an example, like for the last two years during the pandemic, everybody has been so emotionally exhausted and so overwhelmed at times that bringing to the table a feeling of care, right? Um, like literally our brains, I think, protect us by sort of resist, like we can't feel care for everything. You can't, you'll just get overwhelmed to the point of inaction. But even when it's hard for me to like dig down and feel that thing, that doesn't mean it's impossible for me to do that thing. And, and I'm wondering about that a lot, like, because I remember at times there, there's been sort of a critique of this idea of performing care. Like what is it like performing care isn't the same thing as caring, which I completely get and I understand, but it reminds me a little bit of like the fake it till you make it sort of perspective, which is like even on days when it's really hard for me <laughs> to feel the care, that doesn't mean I can't do the care. And sometimes in doing the care that reignites the feeling of the care. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I mean, I end up collaborating with a lot of nursing faculty, I think probably because so many of the things that I say in my work resonates with nursing faculty and also nursing faculty end up having one of the most um, 
rigorous, uh, intense, standardized set of standards that have to be met for their licensure. And so there's kind of a tension between the work that they do and then the way that their work is, is uh, licensed. So I end up in a lot of conversations with nursing faculty and I think about the notion of care work and the notion of showing up for the labor of care um, which doesn't necessarily, we show up to that work in lots of different ways from day to day. I think one of the things that's required in that work is self-care also, recognizing that we have to be doing this work for students, with students, but also for ourselves and for each other. And one of the things that's interesting, and I've been talking a lot more as I've talked about moving from my sentence, start by trusting students, to also the, the, the important corollaries sentence, which is start by trusting teachers, is that, is that the, our systems have set up a space of competition, space of hierarchy, a space of tension between teachers and students and between students and each other. But they've, it's also set up that relationship between teachers and between academic staff at institutions. And so finding ways to be doing this work together feels incredibly important. This can't be work that we do by ourselves. It can't be work that we do in isolation. I wanna come back to the word that I used, which was consensual. And that to me is really important. It's really important because I think that care, care work uh, can be uh, patronizing. If, if it's done presumptively, if it's done without knowing who students are, what students actually need. Uh, I think there's a, there's a way in which students have dis difficulty asking for help. We know that to be true. Um, and so setting up systems where that either make help, asking for help easier, and also build flexibility into our system so that someone doesn't even necessarily always have to ask for help, especially the students who are struggling the most. But I think that along with that, and I, you know, I've often said that the students struggling the most are the ones least likely to ask for help. But I think also the students struggling the most are the least, the ones least able to refuse help that's patronizingly offered. <laughs> So we have to be really careful about how we build how we build those relationships so that we're not presuming what students what students what kind of help students might need. That's why I really think that, that you know the thing I've said is make sure you know to have our syllabus start with the sentence hello how are you and I mean that both literally and metaphorically. It means asking questions, how are you? What do you need? Uh, how can I help? You know, making sure that those kind of sentences are what we what we lead that work with to try and figure out where students are actually at and what they need. And then truthfully, I feel like it's it, it, like, it, I have a real problem with creating accommodations when oftentimes what people need is they need flex, flexibility built into the system in advance so that they don't even have to ask for accommodations. And so that we don't have to offer accommodations. The interesting thing about that is that there's labor happening on both ends, difficult labor, the labor of asking for an accommodation and the labor of figuring out what accommodation to offer and when to offer it and how to offer it, and then how to monitor it, which is what so often happens with accommodations. Can we create flexibilities into our system like this feels like work that comes from care. Can we build flexibility into our systems that makes life easier for students and also makes life easier for us and allows us to center the work on those conversations rather than figuring out bureaucratic details? I want to um, go back to this idea of cons consensual and sort of reciprocity of care and what that looks like in pedagogy. And um, one of our participants this week um, put a question to the to the mod to, to the DF um, particip other participants that I want to throw in here, which is what are some of the ways that students can participate in a community of care and demonstrate care and compassion for their instructors. Um, and, and I know Hannah has been working with some of our collab student affiliates on a program for next week um, about care um, and they, I think this is something that's come to the forefront in those conversations as well as those students recognizing that their faculty, their, their, their teachers need to be cared for as well. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about this. Like what, how should we be framing that within and, and also recognizing that like what we don't want to turn this into is, hey, how are you going to take care of me kids, kiddos, which yeah. we shouldn't call our students kids anyway. But, um, you know, like we don't want, we definitely don't want that dynamic, no. but there does seem like sometimes um, 
there's an opportunity there that maybe we're not picking up on. I think also, and I think that's Robin, the Chevy, <laughs> the want to buy a Chevy. Um, Robin <laughs> in the funny. chat, and now I sort of went out of focus just as I said that. I don't, oh, there, we're, there I am, now I'm back in focus. Um, I think there's something important in um, that comment there about the fact that sometimes the people who need the support the most or the flexibility or the care are not only the ones least likely to ask for it, but the ones that the ones that make it most difficult for us to give it. Um, mm -hmm. Because when you're experiencing acute or chronic trauma, you are in a space of not being able to care for other people in some cases. Um, and so being sensitive to that, I think is important. Recognizing that people don't need to deserve our, you know, they don't need to, sh well, they, they don't need to, sh they, of course they deserve it. They don't need to somehow show that they deserve right. they our don't need care to prove their worth. or our flexibility yeah. Yeah. or to prove yeah. their worth. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I, I really want to talk about how we ask for care ourselves. Mm -hmm. I often, so I don't have any, um, due dates on myself. Well, they're not, I don't, I don't not have any. I, I often have a couple and it's because there's some, we're having a film festival tomorrow. So you actually have to have your film done by tomorrow. So I do have some due dates, but for the most part, my syllabus has no due dates on it. It has little spaces of time where the, where the activities live that kind of are suggestive of when they might happen, but I don't ever list a due date. And my, and do I accept like work? 100% of the time. Um, that is something that I do as a teacher, but then I often hear from other teachers, well, gosh, my life is really complex and I can't just have work coming in at any, at any point in time that, that, that expects something of me that I can't give or I don't feel able to give. And for me, getting work in all the time is better. And it's partly because a stack of work, a stack of student work causes me such great anxiety that I don't like work to come in at one time. I actually love it spread out throughout the week. So I build a, I build a policy, I build an approach that is both helpful to my students and also helpful to me. Um, other teachers will say, well, I really need it to come in because this is what my day looks like. And so for me, to me, that's a conversation we have with our students and that we just talk to students about that. When a student asks me, well, what is the due date? I say, and they say, it would be really helpful to me if I had a specific due date. Then I say to them, well, let's figure out a specific due date for you. And then I'll hold you to it if you, if you want me to. Yeah. Um, and, and that's something that I can do for them because they, they want to structure the course in a particular way. I can also ask the same thing of them. Okay, so I'm flexible with due dates. However, this is what my day looks like. And so if at all possible, please try and get your work done at 5 p.m. on Friday. That's the official due date. If you need extra time, I can give it to you. But here's why getting in at 5, 5 p.m. that day is really important to me. Because I've set aside these hours to do this work. And I've got these things going on in my life, which you don't necessarily have to share personal details. Um, and so I think communicating that to the students is good. I mean, it does a couple things. One, it, it um, leans into the social contracts, which social contracts are pretty well proven to be more effective at creating, um, at, at, at getting people to do things for one another mm -hmm. than policies or bureaucratic, um, bureaucratic documents. And so leaning into the social contract, here's who I am, here's what I need. And then that also, the other thing, that great thing that does for the student on the other end is they see you as a full human, which then makes it easier for them to ask for help when they need it or ask for support when they need it. So, it, you know, showing your humanity to students is pedagogical um, and it both is useful for us, but it's also useful for the work of teaching. Yeah, I was, I've been thinking too about the way in which asking for care sometimes is as much a gift for the person who you're asking it of as it is a gift for you. And that sometimes seems kind of counterintuitive, but the example I like to give is um, in like late summer of 2020, my best friend uh, who had a father who was pretty sick at that time and she was his caregiver, both contracted COVID and um, this was, you know, pre-vaccine and everybody, we were pretty, everybody was very worried. They're fine. Everybody pulled through, it was fine. But at the time, um, and I live very far away from her, um, uh, our other friend and, 
and I reached out to her and said, we want to send you food. Like we want to do something. We want to take care of you. And the way that the best way we can think of to do that is to get food delivered. What's your favorite restaurant? What's you and your dad's favorite food from that restaurant? And her response was, oh no, it's okay. You know, my brother just brought us groceries. We've got plenty of food. And I kind of said to her, no, like, I need you to let me do this for you because like, this is how I can take care of you because I can't be there and I can't do anything for you in person. And it's a gift to me for you to let me do this for you. Um, And I think sometimes we lose sight of that in these care relationships. Like, I'm not saying it's always easy, but there are definitely times when you know, we don't want someone's care to be a burden for us, but sometimes accepting care from somebody else is a gift we can give to them. And I think sometimes that may be the case with students as well. Like students want to connect to us as humans. And so being given the opportunity to do something humane and grateful and kind to a teacher or an instructor may be an experience for them that's both unique and also, you know, um, welcome. Yeah. Well, if I think about gifts that students have given me over the years, I really felt that the giving of that gift really did something for them. They had an experience and they wanted to take that experience and put it in some sort of material form. Um, Yes, I loved getting the gift, but I also thought, wow, this is really neat that they did this for them as well. Exactly. Um, Yeah. And we all know that what that's like when you get a gift for somebody and it feels as much a gift to you to be able to give it. Yeah. Um, as for them to receive it. Um, sometimes when I give gifts like that, um, it's all about me. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Like, I just wanted to buy this thing. And I don't know if you really want I think it. one of the other things that I would say, I guess, is that we have to, as human beings, let ourselves not be on all the time, let ourselves not succeed all the time, let ourselves let things fall through the cracks. I mean, generally, when you're talking to a group of academics, you're taught talking to the group of people who did school really well, the people more likely to turn things on time, more likely to do all their homework, more likely to just phone something in in order to get a due date, you know, to get something in by a due date, because there was somehow a personal failing if we didn't let, if we didn't get something in on time. And that also translates to when students ask things of us, we think, well, we have to do it and we have to do it on time. We have to be the best possible teacher we can be every hour of the day. And I think letting ourselves recognize, you no, know, sometimes I actually don't have to be the best teacher every second of every day and that, 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 that that's okay. And I, letting ourselves off the hook, which as even as I say that, I don't know that I ever really let myself off the hook. I have to like, I have to, it, for me, it's a practice. Like I have to say, okay, Jesse, let yourself off the hook for missing this meeting. Um, okay, Jesse, let yourself off the hook for not emailing that student back for five days. Um, and then I have to say it again and again yeah. and again and then again. No, you're absolutely right. It is a practice. <clears throat> um, I want to take a minute now and kind of back up our perspective just a little bit. We've been talking about um, these issues of kind of care within relationships with students within classes that we teach. I wanna now back up to kind of institutional level, um, which is where things sometimes get a little bit, a little bit rougher around this topic. Um, and I, the first thing I wanna ask you is fairly straightforward, which is like, what in your opinion, do we spend too much time caring about in higher education? And then as a corollary, what do we spend too little time caring about? So writ large in higher education, like what do we, where are we putting too much effort to in caring and where are we not putting enough? I think we track too much shit and we're trying, I mean, the same thing that we do with students and I'm grades. I'm so shocked that you think that. Go ahead. <laughs> the same thing that we do with students and grades where we just reduce students to rows in a spreadsheet and their work to columns in a spreadsheet and that the tracking of the thing ends up supplanting the thing itself. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that we're doing that constantly as institutions to ourselves. And the interesting thing is sometimes it's being done to us by the institution, whatever that is, Robin. Um, (laughs) Just kidding. Sometimes it's the institution, like the administration that's doing something to us. But I think often we're also just doing that to ourselves. Um, We're, my institution, University of Denver, my program department, has an annual review process and then it has a promotion process. 
And as I've been at this institution for uh, about a year now, I'm just finding out and I'm just hearing stories about what people are producing for these annual reviews and for these promotion documents. I heard a story of someone producing a 900 page promotion document mm -hmm. that comes with a 3%, the promotion comes with a 3% raise and a title change. And it, it did not seem unusual for these documents to be hundreds of pages, if not up to 900 pages. And then I'm finding about these annual reviews and eh, annual reviews that are 60, 70 pages. And I think to myself of where all of that time could be better spent and what is the motivation for doing those things. Interestingly, I can't find anywhere in any document, in any set of expectations where it's asking that that document be 60 pages. I'm going to go do that document next week, and I'm probably going to start working on it the day that it's due. And I think I'm going to probably get about five to six pages. And to some degree, part of me is like, oh, no, am I going to be fired? Am I, I'm not, my annual contract is not going to get renewed. And I feel this kind of tension around that. And so, I mean, it's an example of a set of, it's not just personal. I mean, I want to be clear. It's not a personal failing that someone produces a 60 page document. There's something in the culture and in the um, social structures of our institutions that makes us feel like we have to account for everything that we do. Mm -hmm. What's also interesting is that when we look at these kind of accountings or these documents, I don't see the person, I don't see the fire or the passion or the amazing work that the person is doing somehow rec recognized in that document. Same thing as when you look at the rows and columns of a grade book the amazing things students do aren't represented well on those documents. And so we need to, we need to not be tracking stuff at the expense of actually, of actually having the experiences with one another and really celebrating each other's accomplishments because a CV does not celebrate your accomplishments. It really doesn't. The form of it, if anything, reduces your accomplishments to just a, a, a set of rows and stacks. Yeah, I'm also thinking too about um, it's so uh, the, the the like the uh, the irony of like the amount of labor that goes into the the kind of activity you're talking about, and how if we were to um, if we were to you know jettison that, how much more time we would have, and how much more energy we would have for the kind of care we're talking about, right? For the kind of care work that is can be can be that also is labor, but that often goes unnoticed as labor, right? It's often invisible labor, um, and and it's like nobody really acknowledges that. I want to talk a little bit about that notion of kind of the invisible la labor of care within the institution. There's lots of um, writing and and studies out there about how particular. Um, people care, um, carry a, a larger burden of this, particularly women and people of color, queer faculty and institutions end up um, being asked to do or being expected to do more kinds of care work for students. And some of that is affinity, right? Like some of that is because students who need care seek out people who they believe will um, understand they're, where they're coming from the, and their particular situation and needs. And so it's about affinity, which is a great thing, right? Like we wanna promote that kind of affinity, but what do we do when that then results in um, those people being asked to do kind of an out of, um, out of bounds amount of work around this and nobody sees it and nobody recognizes it. And probably it's not showing up in that 60 page report. No, no, it's not. Well, I, I know as a, as a, um, as a queer person, I actually feel that, and I felt that for 22 years of my career, both I, in some ways I'm trained to do care work because I come, you know, I was a psychology major as well and come from a family of social workers, therapists, group counselors. And so I sort of grew up with this culture and I grew up with this being part of I'm seeing this as part of my work, not just something that I would do out of my good graces, but part of my work. Um, but I also get asked to do it in very particular ways and in particular circumstances. And I'm often having to stand in for a group of people that are not, rec uh, that are not represented well at my institutions. 
and usually are in, you know, to some extent, you know, being both disabled and queer, both of my minor, my, both of my marginalized statuses are invisible. And so I, I often am experiencing both having to do particular kinds of work, but then not having that work uh, recognized by the institution. Um, or and, and not even recognized is not even the work I, word I want to see, not even seen. Like the structures don't even allow it to be seen mm. in some cases. And um, I don't, I, to me, I feel like something's got to give. And if I think of the role of educators as to be advocates for students, I think the role of administrators has to be to be advocates for teachers. And being advocates for teachers means that administrators need to be doing the work of figuring out what thing can give so that teachers have the time and space and support to do the most critical parts of their work. And so to me, that means, it means that as an administrator, I say, um, I'm sorry, your annual review can be no more than five pages. And I will literally chop off pages six through 10. I know that feels really heartless, but to some extent we have to figure out ways to set boundaries that basically say to people, this isn't the important part of your work. Um, there's a, this maybe is necessary for various reasons, but it isn't the critical part. And so I need you to focus your attention. I need you to focus your attention elsewhere and keep yourself focused on bringing yourself healthily to the, to that critical work. And, and then as people ourselves, like this is where supporting each other needs to come into place. Yeah. If me and Martha and Robin all have to submit our annual reports, we agree as a group that none of our annual reports are gonna be more than five pages. And so we, we're gonna do a haiku. We're gonna do a haiku, yeah, actually, gosh, can I? <laughs> And so that way that there's a sense of solidarity and to break that competitiveness, because there was something said in the chat that yeah. if yours isn't the longest, yeah. somehow you failed to really do your job. Well, and uh, how interesting, because the um, the origin of that particular myth probably was learned in a classroom, right? Like mm -hmm. that probably all comes back to um, structures within within pedagogical structures that somebody has experienced. Well, and there's a thing there because I actually on my written assignments, I don't put word counts. Um, it, and if I do put word counts, I put really broad word counts. Like it could be 500 to 1500 words. And I do that almost out of absurdity to say, I really want you to figure out what shape this needs to take. And then I always tell students like, one person might write a series of postcards that are each little neat and tidy poems to answer the prompt. And another person might write narrative, uh, you know, stream of consciousness, narrative biography. Yeah. And those are such different forms. And so, but I also want to say that to some degree, sometimes when we don't give people a maximum, we end up creating a system where people are constantly trying to do better and better and better and better. And I think academia has a lot of invisible goalposts. And, and I think we experience those invisible goalposts. And so to some degree, we expect students to be able to navigate a set of invisible goalposts. Yeah. But to go back to the issue of marginalization, the most marginalized people are the least capable of dealing with invisible goalposts because they have no clue what they even are or where they are. Right, yeah. I mean, if they, if they avoid them, it's almost through pure luck not yeah. through any kind of deliberate choice. I, something you said um, intersects really nicely with, um, with another kind of tension that we've been exploring this week, which is, um, you know, you're talking about the student who might do, you know, I can't remember your example, but like a haiku versus like a, you know, a, a 2000 word uh, autobiography. Um, and so one of the, one of the things people we've been talking about is this, um, this tension of fairness around care, right? And so like so many of the practices that we imagine as being caring practices or, or practices around flexibility and um, giving people uh, different options and being willing to um, be, um, rethink um, things with students. But then what does that look like in the, con in the um, context of fairness and the, the quote unquote equal playing field? So like if I give this student an extension, don't I have to give everybody an extension or else it's not fair? Can you talk a little bit about that tension and how you approach that? 
Um, well, gosh, if I think there's something that we should care a whole lot less about, it's fairness. <laughs> um, because I think fairness in, it, oftentimes it, it is a violence that we do. And I mean that, and I don't mean to overstate that. I want to be really clear that I think it does harm, and in some cases, physical harm to people. And I was just watching a... Um, I was just watching a conversation happen on Twitter, which I did not step into because I'm, I'm trying to take a, a, a pause. <laughs> um, but I wanted to step in because it was a debate about, oh gosh, now we're talking all the time about equity in K-12. This was a conversation in K-12 education. So I've started to see this same thing happening in higher education conversations too. All we're ever talking about equity. Equity is an unrealizable ideal. And we've thrown out equality in order to try and tackle this unrealized ideal, which is equity. And um, I just... It, and I, it, you know, just thinking about that distinction between equality and equity, trying to imagine that all people are equal, that they will all start at the same place, that they can all end up at the same place, seems harmful. So to me, it's not like you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. It's like you're throwing out something that is actually an affront to equity mm. um, in order to try and move towards a space that is equitable. I don't th I think equitable equity is really complex. Because figuring out where everyone starts and all the challenges that everyone is dealing with mm -hmm. is impossible. Mm -hmm. Figuring out how to get them all somewhere by the end and then assess where they got at the end, mm -hmm. also pretty impossible. But I think the impossibility of equity um, doesn't necessarily preclude us working as hard as we can. I almost used the F word because I felt like it was important there, but I, I decided not to. Um, <laughs> It, working as hard as we can towards it, because ultimately that to me feels, it's more important for us to figure out where people are starting than where we want them to end up. Yeah, that's such a great point. And we're we're coming up on the 45 minute mark and I that is what we scheduled for this. And I wanna be mindful of anybody who needs to um, bow out at this time. Um, because that's what we said. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, but I think there is um, a, an opportunity.